Okay, so we're going to start. Um, yeah, here, if you could mute. He is muted. He, he just is? has to. Jan, just you need, Jan, speak, you yeah. need to say something. And you'll uh, hi. Hey, I'm here. Thank How's it going, everyone? <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. Jan, all the way from California. Uh, Jan Render, Dr. Jan Render is currently a postdoc at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. He uh, was trained in un as an undergraduate by Thorsten Kleiner in the Westfälische Wilhelm University in Münster, Germany, uh, a Cosmo chemist. And he did his PhD at uh, VVU with Greg Brennecker. And then he went to a postdoc position at Münster. However, that was just as the pandemic started. So we all know what that does to us. Uh, and then not long after that, he moved to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory to continue as a postdoc where he is now. And he's expanded into lunar studies and terrestrial geochemistry. But today he's going to talk to us about how cosmochemistry can reconstruct the architecture of the solar system. So with that, Jan, welcome and thank you very much for joining. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat box, uh, but I'll take it, leave it up to you now, and I'm going to hide your face so your screen is the uh, main visual point. So one sec. Sounds good, and uh, thanks for the introduction. So hi, everyone from California. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it all the way over to the East Coast for this talk, but uh, I want to emphasize that I nevertheless appreciate the invitation of giving a seminar here at Rutgers, and maybe these e-seminars are one of the few good things that came together with the pandemic for us to be able to connect a little bit better. Uh, so before getting started with the slides here, I'd also like to emphasize that the projects and the data that I'm going to present, uh, these are the results of collaborations with uh, Greg Brennecker, who is now at Lawrence Livermore, also with Mario fischer gotter who's at University of Cologne now, as well as with Christoph Burkhardt and Thorsten Kleine who I worked with at the University of Münster and who now just moved to the Max Planck's Institute in uh, Göttingen. And so the idea that I'd like to bring across here today uh, is how we can make use of isotopic compositions in a handful of elements to get a better idea of what the earliest stages of our solar system may have looked like. That's because planetary systems, including ours, they go through a couple of very different evolutionary stages. Typically, they are assumed to start as these giant molecular clouds in star forming regions. For example, here shown is the Eagle Nebula in this image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And so in these regions, some of the denser cores can collapse into accretion disks with young stars being surrounded by dust and gas until they flatten out into protoplanetary disks. And then finally into the actual planetary system such as we know ours today. And so with the most modern telescopes, we are even able to reveal the presence of rings and gaps in remote stellar systems. And so this has been suggested to perhaps capture the moment of planet formation in these exoplanetary systems. But especially between these last two artist conceptions that you can see here, there's actually a considerable temporal gap of more than 4 billion years of solar system history and evolution and so obviously this leaves us with a lot of open questions unanswered. So for example, the solar system currently consists of these small terrestrial planets in the inner regions, as well as the gas giants in the outer solar system. And so this particular configuration appears to be quite unique compared to the uh, exoplanetary systems that we have discovered within the last few decades. Then furthermore, these uh, inner and outer regions are separated through an asteroid belt that's between Mars and Jupiter here. And this particular reason is very interesting for us cosmochemists because these asteroids and the planetesimals in there, these contain the most primitive debris from the very beginnings of our solar system. And also these were most likely involved in the accretion of the planets that we see today. So fortunately for us, these planetary building blocks here are available in the form of meteorites to us. And this allows us to compare the properties and the compositions of the early solar system. And we can compare that to the present day. And so meteorites, these can be subdivided into several categories, uh, including the more primitive chondritic meteorites shown here on the left, 
uh, as well as the differentiated beach roads. I don't know if you can see my mouse here on the right. And just to give you a rough idea of this diversity, so we have samples today from Mars, from the Moon, as well as meteorites that have been linked to specific asteroids in the asteroid belt, for example, the asteroid 4 Vesta. And just alone, these three major contract classes that you can see here on the left, uh, the carbonaceous, the ordinary, and the insular chondrites, these already cover a very wide range of chemical compositions, as can be seen in these various diagrams here with uh, different elemental abundances plotted against one another. Then again, despite these huge chemical and mineralogical differences between these various chondritic and differentiated meteorites, they are all found together in this narrow band of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And so this strikingly diverse assemblage in such a small band kind of indicates to us that this current extent of the asteroid belt might not necessarily be representative of the entire region where all the meteorites that we currently know are created from. Or in other words, this current system, this current architecture of the solar system is unlikely the same as its original configurations from more than 4 billion years ago. So such changes in the structure of our protoplanetary disks have been previously suggested, and they are usually explained through the movement of the gas giants in the early solar system. For example, shown here are the Grand Tech and Nice models, and in the solar system reorganization models, the gas giants are assumed to have migrated inwards or outwards or both over time, and thus caused intensive radial mixing and chaos within the first few billion years of uh, solar system evolution, actually. And so the question that I'd like to address in today's talk is, can we perhaps reconstruct what the original structure of the solar system may have looked like? So arguably, if we think back of the early solar system, the most notable difference between an and solar system is the difference in temperature, where with increasing distance from the sun, this results in lower temperatures. And as a result, we could, for example, expect to see higher volatile contents, for example, water or ice in the outer parts of the solar system. And it has indeed been shown that the fraction of water in these different meteorite groups scales with their putative positions in the asteroid belts, increasing from ancillate chondrites to ordinary chondrites to carbonaceous meteorites, and finally to the few main belt comets, uh, as shown in this diagram here from Fritz and co workers. But at the same time, it should be noted here that these different meteorites in this diagram are just linked to the current positions of asteroid families because of spectroscopic differences, uh, similarities. So the distances here, they should be taken with a grain of salt. And perhaps not surprisingly, there are also some issues when it comes to using water alone as a proxy for accretion distance. The most notable example is perhaps our own planet Earth, that despite its position in the most inner solar system, exhibits a comparatively high water abundance as well as other volatile elements. And this is most likely due to the late accretion of volatile rich material to Earth. So this example already shows us that although water can give us a rough idea for inferring these formation regions in the solar system, it is perhaps not the most reliable proxy. So another approach that I'd like to bring forward today here are isotopic anomalies of nucleosynthetic origin. And these arise from pre-solar dust that must have been incorporated during the very early stages into our solar system. So these pre-solar grains, including silicon carbide and graphite and others, they were produced in previous generations of stars that each had a distinct isotopic fingerprint. And due to the fact that the pre-solar matter was not entirely homogenized in our solar system, each of these meteorite groups uh, appears to have captured a slightly different mixture of pre-solar matter. And so these small differences in the isotopic compositions of meteorites can act as fingerprints for their underlying source material. And what's also great about this is that these are very unlikely to be overprinted by late stage processes, such as, for example, thermal metamorphism or aqueous alteration. And this makes them perhaps a little bit more reliable compared to chemical signatures, such as water content, for instance. So as such, these isotopic anomalies are perfectly suited 
for investigating potential relationships between meteorites or for meteorites and Earth, for example. And just to give you a specific example of what I mean by this, I'm going to switch over to a diagram here of the two most neutron-rich isotopes in the two elements titanium and chromium, which Paul Warren in 2011 used to show us that all of these different meteorites generally cluster into these two major meteorite categories with the so-called carbonaceous or CC group having more of these neutron-rich isotopes compared to the non-carbonaceous or NC group shown here in red. And because the NC group also contains Mars, Moon, and Earth, Warren then concluded that these materials must represent stuff that formed in the inner solar system, whereas the more volatile rich carbonaceous materials most likely represent the outer solar system. And so this isotopic dichotomy has since been found to be present in several other elements, and it has been argued that an early form Jupiter could have been a likely candidate for a feature in the disk that may have separated these two major reservoirs for the first few million years. And so assuming that this is all correct, then we have these two major categories of meteorites and perhaps separated through an early form Jupiter into an outer solar system. That's a great start already, but at the same time, that's pretty broad. It's a pretty broad idea of what the early solar system may have looked like. And so in this work, our aim was to integrate this with isotopic compositions of other elements to see if we can perhaps achieve a finer scale in cosmolocating the accretion orbits of these different in meteorite groups. So to answer this question, I'd like to redirect our attention away from titanium and chromium. And instead we'll switch over to molybdenum, which uh, has become a quite popular element in the cosmochemistry community recently. And that's because on the one hand, molybdenum is highly refractory, meaning it condensed very early in solar system history and is also unlikely to have been lost or altered during high temperature processes. Uh, it's also moderately siderophile or iron loving, meaning that during planetary differentiation, it prefers to bond with iron nickel metals and is thus sequestered into the metallic cores of planetesimals to various degrees. And therefore, it's also particularly well suited for investigations of iron meteorites, but it's also abundant in chondritic meteorites because there are these uh, metallic phases or in chondrules, both of which host significant amounts of molybdenum. The main advantage of molybdenum in terms of nuclear synthetic anomalies is that it has seven stable isotopes, as well as the fact that it is heavier than elements of the iron peak, as for instance, titanium and chromium are. And this means that molybdenum cannot be produced through these conventional nuclear fusion processes that take place in almost all types of stellar environments. But instead that all of the molybdenum that is present in our solar system today comes from only three different nucleosynthetic processes. And those are the P, the S, and the R processes. And these can be more or less attributed to a particular stellar environment, which is quite nice for us. So the two lighter isotopes, 92 and 94 molybdenum, are almost pure P process isotopes, whereas the heaviest isotope, 100 molybdenum, is almost pure R process. And the remaining mix, uh, the remaining isotopes are mixtures of S and R. And due to the way that uh, our measurements are being performed, we always need two of these isotopes to internally normalize our data and to cancel out any fractionation that is caused by our mass spectrometers. So for these two isotopes, we cannot measure any isotopic anomalies. And in the case of molybdenum, these two isotopes are most commonly used are 96 and 98 molybdenum. But this still leaves us then with five isotopes for which isotopic anomalies can be displayed. So the advantage of having so many isotopes uh, is that the compositions can be shown in the form of these patterns here, uh, in the form of anomaly versus the different molybdenum isotopes. And the isotopic ratio of a given sample is then normalized against the terrestrial isotopic composition and uh, such that any sample from Earth then has no isotopic anomaly or is always zero as represented by the green horizontal line here. But in contrast to that, meteorites can have incorporated slightly different mixtures of pre-solar matter compared to Earth, and thus they can be enriched in one of these three or in many of these three nucleus and three components relative to the terrestrial molybdenum. So for instance, if we would find a meteorite with an excess of P-process molybdenum, 
this would result in a very distinctive pattern as shown here with the dash blue line. And comparatively, we can also model, for example, an excess in R process as shown here by the red line, as well as the deficit, for example, in S process molybdenum. And so each of these different patterns are quite unique, which is very advantageous for characterizing the nucleus nucleosynthetic matter of uh, various meteorites. And yeah, so with this, all of this out of the way, we can now get down to the nitty gritty. So to start this project off, we decided to digest a few samples of all of the three major chondrite glasses, including encetide. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what was that? And uh, ordinate and chondrite uh, glasses. And so these were then processed using ion exchange chromatography to purify the molybdenum of these samples, which were then analyzed using a Neptune plus mass spectrometer. So as shown here for the first isotope 92 molybdenum, we will make use of the so-called mu notation to show the data. And this goes back to the idea that Earth as defined by our solution standard is always zero and that any isotopic anomaly will be shown as parts per million deviations relative to this terrestrial isotopic ratio. So a USGS basalt from Hawaii, for instance, is uh, always indistinguishable from our Refnel standard and has no isotopic anomaly, as can be seen here. All right, so we can continue with 92 molybdenum to compare the data for meteorites now. And again, we're using the mu notation here with the vertical white bar marking the terrestrial isotopic composition. And whereas our terrestrial basalt is indistinguishable from zero or terrestrial, almost all of the meteorites that we investigate here show these positive resolved anomalies relative to Earth. So this means that they are enriched in the specific isotope relative to terrestrial values. And what's also important is that both encetide and ordinary chondrites yield indistinguishable molybdenum isotopic signatures. And this is not only the case for 92 molybdenum, but also, for example, if we look at 94 molybdenum, 95 molybdenum, and so on. And this then allows us to calculate group means for both encetide and ordinary chondrites for each molybdenum isotopes, which then looks something like this. So the first thing that we can hopefully all see here is that these both meteorite groups show very similar patterns. And secondly, that uh, the ordinary chondrites shown here in orange see it to be slightly more anomalous relative to the encetide chondrites. Uh, we can then also change the scale of the y-axis a little bit and add the carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, here shown our CV group. And uh, these are also similarly enriched in all the molybdenum isotopes relative to Earth, but even more anomalous. And so despite these meteorites being chemically and mineralogical very different from another here, what I want to show is that they all have the same pattern in molybdenum, but to very different extents. Uh, for all of these three meteorite classes, uh, these patterns also fit almost perfectly to a calculated S deficit pattern. And this is also what previous studies observed for similar and for other meteorites. And this includes, but is not limited to the two studies that I've listed here. Uh, so all of this together is already like a lot, like a lot can be discussed from these data alone. But what's perhaps particularly interesting regarding the scope of this talk is that the specific sequence of progressively larger anomalies here, increasing from Earth to encetite to ordinary and to finally to uh, these carbonaceous chondrites, this order might ring a bell. And that's because we've seen the exact sequence before earlier in the talk when we we're talking about the distribution of water in these different solar system materials. So here we also saw the water mass fraction increasing from Earth to encetite to ordinary and to carbonaceous chondrites. And this means that there's not only a relationship between the putative formation distance and volatile content, but also this general correlation of the magnitude of isotopic anomalies and their presumed positions from the sun, again, with the anomalies getting larger from Earth to the NC chondrite groups, and finally to the CC gombrites that are generally assumed to have formed in the audio solar system. And so, Coming back now to the initial question, whether we can achieve a finer scale in cosmolocating meteoritic accretion orbits, well, we can now use these isotopic data and then assign relative positions to Earth, to encetide chondrites, and finally to the carbonaceous chondrites as a function of isotopic anomalies. And instead of having to rely on water alone as a potentially unstable, unreliable proxy here, 
we can now also infer these different heliocentric formation distance of a given meteorite by leveraging their isotopic composition against one another. And so to test this idea a little bit further, we then decided to investigate another type of meteorite that has caused us cosmochemists quite a bit of a headache in the past. And uh, that's because whereas the Earth's water content is way too high compared to its presumed formation distance, there are also certain types of meteorites, the so-called basaltic achondrites, and these are formed to have uh, created uh, somewhere close to ordinary chondrites, but they hardly contain any water, and that's because they were almost completely devolatilized during their accretion. But uh, also, as I mentioned before, these nucleosynthetic isotope anomalies are far less susceptible to such late stage processes. And so we should be able to test this new model of larger anomalies with increasing distance from the sun by measuring the isotopic compositions of these samples. And so therefore we set out to investigate a total of 10 basaltic achondrites, including five angrites and five eucrites. And so this latter type is perhaps particularly interesting because these are thought to represent crustal material from the asteroid 4 Vesta. So these actual meteorites have been already connected to a parent body in the asteroid belt. And for angrites, on the other hand, we do not exo know exactly where they come from. And so their parent body is usually simply referred to as the angrite parent body or APB. Um, when it comes to investigating the isotopic compositions of such achondritic meteorites, however, there's a few minor problems that we have to deal with. Uh, the first one is that the element that we've been using so far is siderophile in its geochemical character. And this means that most, if not all, of the molybdenum that was initially present in Vesta and the angrite parent body has now been sequestered into their metallic cores. And so we are left with little to no molybdenum in the cluster samples that we are interested in. So instead, we can now switch to another element, and this one is lithophile and thus enriched in the basaltic achondrites. And this is a rare earth element, uh, neodymium. What's nice about neodymium, that similar to molybdenum, it occurs as seven stable isotopes. And these are also produced by the by varying amounts of the same three nucleosynthetic processes that we discussed before. And so once again, these isotopic compositions can be used as fingerprints to infer these small variations in these nucleosynthetic components of any given sample. Uh, then the second problem that we have to deal with is radiogenic ingrowth from two uh, unstable samarium isotopes. And this is a very convenient thing to have when it comes to dating samples, but here we are only interested in the nucleosynthetic isotope variations, and such, large, such radiogenic ingrowth can complicate things quite a bit for us. So in detail, there is a radiogenic ingrowth from the long-lived isotope 147 samarium that decays into 143 neodymium, and we cannot correct for this in growth because it is long lived. It's a radio chain contribution that is far larger than the nucleosynthetic isotope variations uh, we are interested in. Uh, and so, as a consequence, there will be no data reported for 143 neodymium. However, we are able to correct for the small radiogenic ingrowth from 146 samarium into 142 neodymium. And this can be done by accounting for the samarium neodymium ratio that must be determined for each individual sample. Then finally, we also again need two isotopes for normalizing the data. And in the case of neodymium, these are typically 144 and 146 neodymium, but still this leaves us with four isotopes, 142, 145, 148, and 150 neodymium for which we uh, can focus on. Uh, the measurements this time were performed on a Triton Plus TIMS and using a four-line dynamic measurement routine. And with this configuration, we can actually achieve very high precision for these neodymium isotope measurements, as can also be seen for the stress field basalt here with the analytical uncertainties being smaller than 5 ppm for each of the three dynamically obtained isotopes. Uh, for the last isotope, which is 150 neodymium, uh, this is the only isotope that is measured in static mode, so the precision doesn't quite reach this level, but it's still good enough to derive meaningful conclusions from the data. And then the final problem that we are confronted with is related to this precision and the fact that these meteorites 
are derived from the surface of their parent body. And that is that they have been subject to irradiation with high energy particles, which can result in the transformation of nuclides of the target material into other isotopes and elements by means of neutron capture and the subsequent decay of them. And so here, the precision that we can achieve kind of acts as a double-edged sword, and because we now have to account for these potential effects, even though they are generally believed to be small for ne neodymium compared to other elements. And this is important so that we can still guarantee the accuracy of the measurements as well. So we did this by uh, additionally investigating the samarium isotopic compositions of these samples. And that's because the isotope 149 samarium has one of the largest neutron capture cross-section of any isotopes that is out there. And this results in a very high probability of capturing neutrons and then transmutating into 150 samarium. So samarium isotopes are thus a distinguished proxy for neutron capture. And they have been used quite frequently in the past, for example, also for lunar samples as shown here on the right in a study by Lars Borg and co-authors. And luckily for us, the neutron dosages of the achondrites we investigated here are not as high as the lunar samples in this diagram and only cover a small portion of this diagram that you can see here. But even this small rectangle here is, uh, it corresponds to several hundred ppm of uh, both isotopes compared to the single digit ppm anomalies that we are typically trying to deal with. Uh, due to the fact that each isotope of 149 samarium that captures a neutron, uh, transforms into 150 samarium. Neutron capture leads to a linear regression in this diagram with the deficits in 149 corresponding to excesses in 150 samarium. And all of the samples can be expected to be dragged along this line towards the upper left of the diagram with the increasing dosage. And so as you can see, this is also the case for the basaltic achondrites that we investigated in our study. And we can uh, thus use this to uh, to quantify the irradiation degree for each individual sample and also perform uh, the corrections that we, that we require for each of these different samples. And so while these effects in Samario here are quite large, about 10 to 100 times larger compared to the nucleosynthetic isotope anomalies that we are typically dealing with, it's also important to note that the neutron capture cross-section of the different neodymium isotopes is way smaller. It's about two orders of magnitude smaller compared to samarium at least. And so accordingly, the corrections that we had to perform for these most irradiated samples, even for those, they didn't exceed 3 ppm. And this is also roughly the analytical uncertainty we can achieve with our method. But nevertheless, such corrections become ever more important now with the increments and in precision that we can achieve with these state-of-the-art instruments and methods. And thus, we need to start uh, considering in thinking about those as well. So for example, for ion meteorites, these corrections uh, are already quite the norm and can become quite uh, larger for, for example, molybdenum and tungsten as shown in these two diagrams here. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so with these three problems now being dealt with and being accounted for, we can head on over to the results. And again, the data is being shown here in the mu notation. And we start with the first isotope 145 neodymium where again, you can see that the, similar to the chondritic meteorites that we shown before, all of the achondrites also show these indistinguishable values and are enriched in 145 neodymium relative to Earth. The same is also true for 148 neodymium and also for 150 neodymium. Uh, in 150, there's a little bit more scatter and that's because of the static measurement routine that I mentioned there. Uh, but if we now switch over to the lightest isotope 142 neodymium, you can see that they are no longer indistinguishable and there's uh, clearly, this is clearly not the case. So the reason for this excess of radiation here is the radiogenic ingrowth from 146 samarium that I mentioned earlier. Uh, however, once we account for the different samarium neodymium ratios for each of these samples and correct the radiogenic ingrowth, you can see that all of the anglets and nucleides also indist give indistinguishable nucleosynthetic signatures in this isotope after the corrections. Uh, so this is not really a part of our study here, not really the focus of our study, but perhaps this may be interesting for some of the terrestrial geochemists here in the audience, because this uh, indistinguishable signature in 142 neodymium actually implies that the difference in 142 neodymium isotopic compositions between Earth and meteorites 
is most likely of nucleus and thetic origin and not necessarily related to a different Sumerian neodymium ratio of the bulk earth or the primitive mantle or anything the like. And this perhaps also becomes a little bit more obvious if we compile the group means for the various other ice, uh, uh, various other meteorites uh, in these uh, pattern diagrams as we did before. So the first important thing to note here is that eucrites and engrites show almost indistinguishable uh, nucleosynthetic isotope anomalies. And this indicates that they must have sampled very similar mixtures of pre-solar matter and thus likely formed very close to one another. And uh, also, as we've seen for molybdenum previously, these isotope patterns uh, almost perfectly fit to a calculated S deficit pattern. So once again, it appears that these meteorites are characterized by a deficit in nuclides produced through the S process of nucleosynthesis. And this also fits very well with the difference in 142 neodymium and Earth, uh, as you can see here on the left side of the diagram. So once again, we can zoom out a bit and start layering uh, isotope data with previously investigated uh, chondritic meteorites. Once again, starting with enzyme chondrites, next ordinary chondrites, and finally for the Allende chondrite, which is, which is the carbonaceous chondrite of the CD class. And so once again, you can see that all of these different meteorites here show the same isotopic pattern, but in different magnitudes, including 142 neodymium. And so not only are these data consistent with variable uh, deficits in S process nuclides relative to Earth, but they also show this very same sequence again that we saw before from Earth to enzyme chondrites to ordinary chondrites and to CC chondrites that we've seen before. Uh, what's perhaps also interesting here is that the parent bodies of engrites and eucrites are similar to, but slightly larger perhaps compared to the uh, ordinary chondrites, slightly more anomalous. And this is also roughly where we did expect them to plot. So as I've mentioned before, there's uh, hardly any molybdenum in these basaltic achondrite. But what's also interesting to see is that the uh, single uh, um, measurement that has been performed on one anchorite sample by Buda and co in 2019 conforms very well with what we're seeing here in the dumium isotopes, where it is similar to ordinary chondroids, but perhaps slightly more anomalous. And so this then means that we've got two elements now, one being siderophile and the other being lithophile, that pretty much give us the same sequence of increasing isotopic anomalies. And also both elements are, uh, they indicate that these isotopic compositions are caused by variable de S deficits. So whichever molybdenum isotope and neodymium isotope we then plot against one another, uh, for example, 92 versus 94 uh, versus 145 on the left, or 94 versus 148 here on the right, we always get the same sequence of increasing deficits in S-process isotopes from Earth to enzyme to ordinary and to angrites, and finally to CV chondrites. Just last month, our group was also able to publish a data set for the lithophile, uh, highly zidophile element uh, for the lithophile HFSE zirconium. And here we also see that all of these uh, different elements are, uh, well, they lie together on these S deficit correlations. And then the final element that I would like to add to this collection is ruthenium. And this is a highly siderophile element and uh, therefore primarily found in iron meteorites. And uh, shown here on the diagram on the right from Birmingham and co authors is that most of these iron meteorites also lie right on this uh, S-deficit correlation. So the main point that I want to make for these four different elements here, despite them being characterized by very different cosmo and geochemical behavior, is that they define these very similar trends of variable S-deficits in all kinds of meteorites relative to Earth. So all in all, this must be some fundamental trend of solar system materials that can be seen in multiple very different isotopic systems and also throughout very different solar system materials. And so this, of course, then begs the question how these isotopic variations were caused in the first place and in form, what form they were present in the protoplanetary disks. So, and here, I think our recent zirconium data set comes in quite handy um, because it is quite extensive and uh, this allows us to investigate, for example, whether these isotopic variations could perhaps not also reflect, for example, a temporal trend as opposed to a spatial trend. 
because in this case, later form meteorites could be expected to just have sampled more or less ash process matter compared to older satellites. And to address this question, we can then plot the isotopic anomaly versus the accretion time to see if there would be any sort of correlation between the two parameters. But as you can see, once the data is added, there doesn't really appear to be a single well-defined uh, relationship between accretion time and isotopic composition. In fact, basically, even the uh, early uh, form meteorites already um, they define quite a large range of isotopic compositions. And so this is perhaps furthermore supported by the fact that uh, if we take a closer look here at the carbonaceous meteorites in the lower right of the diagram, you can see that uh, um, these two achondritic meteorites shown at the very bottom here are pretty much indistinguishable or have comparable isotopic compositions to the much later formed uh, undifferentiated chondritic meteorites. And so this also speaks against the spatial distribution. Uh, even though we cannot exclude with certainty that there is a temporal component involved here as well, but taking these observations together should suggest to us that the isotopic heterogeneity that we're seeing in these very different elements must be primarily spatial in origin. All right, so now to uh, wrap this all up and put this into perspective of uh, what we've seen so far. So not only can we categorize meteorites into inner and outer solar system, relative to Jupiter's orbit, but also we can use this increasing deficit in astro-cess nuclides as a function of heliocentric distance, and this allows for way more detailed reconstruction of the early solar system. And so with the combined asset of data that is presently available to us, we can assign relative positions to these various planetary and meteoritic bodies, and uh, by this means cosmolocate their original accretion orbits starting with Earth, then to encetite chondrites, to ordinary chondrites, and angrites and eucrites, before Jupiter finally separates them from the carbonaceous uh, accretion regions in the outer solar system. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, I think we have a few minutes left uh, that I could use to uh, target another topic. Is that correct? Yes. yes. OK. So let me just see if I find this. OK. So another, excuse me. Uh, so another topic uh, that is quite uh, interesting for us cosmochemists is what caused these isotopic heterogeneities in the first place. And uh, for this, there are these two mutually non-exclusive scenarios. In the first one, uh, it is uh, assumed that a heterogeneous infall over time might have caused these uh, different isotopic compositions that we see through our different solar system materials. So in this case, that would be more of a primordial feature that is inherited from the solar system's parental molecular cloud. Whereas in the other scenario, uh, this is more of a feature that was present in the disk with fractionation processes acting on the samples. For example, this could involve size sorting of dust grains or the selective destruction of thermally labial uh, pre-solar components. And so one way to tackle this is by look at all these different elements for which isotopic compositions are now available to us. So here is just a summary of various elements uh, plotted against one another. And uh, the important thing here is that these elements uh, involve very different cosmo and geochemical character, like they start from being refractory to moderately volatile to lithophile to siderophile. They include elements from the iron peak, but also elements that are only produced through these uh, three different uh, neutron capture processes, like the S, R, and P processes. Uh, but what's interesting to see about this, even if we now include our recent zirconium data set, you can see that all of these elements kind of show a very similar uh, relationship to one another. So not only do we see correlations within the region of the NC meteorites, as shown here in red everywhere, you can see that they are linearly correlated uh, to various degrees. Um, but also we can see that the carbonaceous region shown here in blue always appears to be in between the NC region and the CAIs, which are outside of the uh, diagrams shown here. But you can see the directions being marked by these different arrows here. 
And so we can use these very different elements basically to uh, evaluate which of these processes might have perhaps have a more significant role for generating these isotopic anomalies that we're seeing throughout the solar system. So yeah, as I mentioned before, it's very important to consider that all of these different elements have very different cosmo and geochemical character involving these different nucleosynthetic origins, as well as being refractory, volatile, lithophile, and siderophile. And so if we plot them into a diagram where we evaluate the fraction of NC material in the CC reservoir, assuming that the CC reservoir represents a mixture of CAIs and NC, you can see that for all of these different elements, the fraction is very similar and actually lies around two thirds or so, so 60 to 70 percent, uh, including errors. And this is quite surprising considering uh, the different character, because this basically means uh, that a single pre-solar character, uh, a single pre-solar phase is unlikely uh, to have caused this isotopic variations, because we would not assume these very different elements all to be involved to the same degrees in any pre-solar carrier, carrier, for example, silicon carbide. So what this basically tells us that uh, protoplanetary disk processes that affect the size distribution or affect a similar uh, pre-solar carrier is unlikely to explain the isotopic anomalies that we're seeing throughout the solar system. And instead, we currently actually favor the idea that this might have been caused by a heterogeneous infall where material with a solar chemical composition but a slightly different isotopic composition might have caused these variable isotopic compositions, compositions that we see today. So that was just a brief excourse into something else. And with this, I'll uh, conclude my talk and uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm also happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks. Very much, Jan. That was a very nice talk. I'd like to see if there are any questions uh, online or in the room. Well, I'm going to start with a question. Yeah. And that is what's going on with your 150 neodymium data? It seems different uh, if you look at the comparison to the S process model. And also slightly different uh, relationship between your angrites and your eugrites. Right. Yeah, you can see here that the uh, 150 neodymium data appears to be a little bit higher for our uh, uh, basaltic achondrites compared to the calculated S deficit pattern. But it's also very important to consider that this is the only isotope here that is only measured in static mode. And so the uh, error bars for this particular isotopes are also quite a bit larger. So in fact, both of these meteorites here would still be indistinguishable from the calculated S deficit patterns if I would have uh, added the error bars here for these two different meteorites. Uh, and similarly, these uh, deficits in various nucleosynthetic processes are also highly dependent on the model parameter of um, these astrophysical models that generate these patterns in the first place. And so they highly um, they are highly affected, for example, by different neutron capture cross sections of the different isotopes. So this could also explain slightly differences in the uh, between the patterns and the actual data of meteorites that were seen. Alternatively, it is also it cannot be fully included fully excluded that there might be a slight difference in the processes that it is not entirely caused by a deficit in S process variation alone, but that there could be an additional, very small though, uh, R process component being involved here as well. So those would be a few um, solutions to this apparent uh, deviation. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Thank you. Um, we see Ben Black, um, if you want to unmute Ben. Uh, um, <laughs> hi, Jan. Thanks. That was a hi, ben. Really interesting talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, Thanks. Uh, so I was curious, you see this seemingly really nice uh, progression uh, 
in terms of the location in the solar system and how much F S deficit signature uh, you expect. I'm wondering if if you had a body like Earth where you had material added later on from somewhere else in the solar system, is that something where you would ex expect to be able to see that? Like, so say you had something from further out that had more S deficit, would you expect to see that ever in different sy systems? Um, like the signature of late accretion and the S deficit addition and where that came from or no? Right, that's a very good point. So actually this depends quite a bit on the element that you're investigating. Um, so if I just go back here to the slide, we're showing molybdenum, for example. So uh, you can imagine that basically most of the molybdenum as well was sequestered into uh, Earth's core during its metal silicate differentiation. And so the molybdenum that we're measuring today in the Earth's mantle is uh, somewhat biased because it basically only gives us the last few bits of uh, accretion um, that uh, was basically added to our Earth after the metal silicate differentiation was already complete. So for molybdenum, uh, it is quite interesting because these last few bits seem to be similar to what we're seeing in neodymium. So if I go back to uh, just a second, to this slide here, you can see that uh, molybdenum and neodymium behave very similarly. They show the very same trend. Uh, and satellite chondrites appear to be slightly more anomalous compared to Earth. And so one way to interpret to interpret this is that the accretion hasn't changed that much over time for Earth, because otherwise we wouldn't expect Earth to lie on the same trend between neodymium and molybdenum here and these different um, meteorites. But at the same time, you can also see for the right diagram here, 94 molybdenum versus 148 neodymium, uh, the trend of the meteorites could be slightly different from Earth. It's not quite resolved yet, but uh, if one were to plot a lot of meteorites here, there might be a slight difference where Earth might not lie on the same correlation as these different meteorites. And so this could then mean that the last few bits of accretion that were added to Earth might have been isotopically different. So another element where that can be actually uh, seen quite well is zinc. Zinc is uh, pretty volatile, and uh, there is also a, um, uh, a general correlation in zinc isotopes, but in, uh, in zinc isotope space, Earth lies actually between the non-carbonaceous and the carbonaceous meteorites. And that has been suggested to potentially reflect the fact that Earth might have sampled more carbonaceous material at the very end of its uh, accretion. This is uh, two papers that just came out this year, I think, by uh, the Münster Group and another one by Paolo Sossi, if I remember correctly. Thank you. Hope this helps. Yeah, interesting. I would also add that Edimium records a different part of a secretion history compared to your serophile that is right. a small element. So yeah, we'll that's that's the important point, basically, that like neodymium gives us an average of the entire accretion history of Earth because it was never sequestered into Earth's core, whereas uh, molybdenum uh, largely focuses on these last 10 to 20 percent or so of material added to Earth after core uh, metal after metal, metal silicate differentiation was complete. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I have one that I know we've talked about in class a little bit, and that is that the inference that NC and CC reflects inner and outer solar system uh, accretion zones is based on the fact that the CC meteorites tend to have a slightly higher volatile percent than the NCs. Yes. But some of the CCs are not very volatile and rich. And so uh, what is your view on some of the subtlety of those volatile element variations, yet the consistency in the isotopic nucleosynthetic uh, groupings that we see in NCCC? Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the idea, I think, that carbonaceous uh, material is more likely to reflect the outer solar system makes at least sense to me, whether they are actually past Jupiter or not is somewhat more difficult to tell. 
but the fact uh, that we have uh, carbonaceous achondrite and uh, chondrites, which both show this uh, very different isotopic compositions, this tells us that these reservoirs must have been uh, spatially separated for quite some time, for several million years, actually. And so this seems to be a hard, uh, this would be difficult to, for that to be possible unless they were in a very different location, I think, compared to all of the NC meteorites and in so many different elements as well. So once again, if we look at this um, compilation here of uh, isotope data with very different elements, uh, and we see that Earth, Moon, and Mars are always part of the NC region. Um, this seems to me to pretty strongly suggest that uh, the carbonaceous reservoir must have been pretty far away and separated for quite some time. Um, there's also this very recent paper by uh, Hopp and co-workers about iron isotopic compositions in the chondrites and the Ryugu sample that was just returned by the Japanese uh, asteroid sample material mission. And they uh, even uh, suggest the existence of another reservoir, which would be defined by these different CI chondrites and thus might have perhaps uh, been even further outside in the protoplanetary disks based also on the higher volatile content of CI chondrites relative to the carbonaceous meteorites. So to me, this mostly makes sense, but to actually make the point to unambiguously show that um, carbonaceous chondrites might have formed so and so far out is still very difficult to make, I think. Yeah, I think, I think it speaks to the difficulty in uh, analyzing and interpreting volatile element data and the isotopic data. Those, those elements move around a lot. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I think at this point we'll say no, there aren't, but Jan, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you once again for the invitation.